Lebowski Factory. Good evening and welcome again, everybody, to Musky Monday series episode, Musky Monday seminar series episode 20. Who would have thought it? Um, thanks to Slide in the Drift for rocking us in all of these weeks. If you're here right now, it's uh, the May 2-4 weekend. It's a beautiful Monday night. You have a serious musky problem. And you are in the right place to deal with that. Because we got a whole bunch of people with serious musky problems uh, right here to sh share their troubles um, with you. So we'll all help each other together. We'll all get through this. And... Uh, Wow, we're so close to the start of the musky season. Are you ready? Are you ready for the opener? Uh, spring is a time of year when a musky hunter must read and analyze conditions more than any other time of the year to be successful. There's simply more variables in play um, that directly influence behavior, uh, appetite, and attitude, and aggression. And so we're going to talk about what triggers are, what brings all of those out, um, when is prime time for a muskie in the spring, um, understanding how spring unfolded on the water, when the spawn actually occurred, where your fish spawn. Um, you need to know these things to be successful at the start of the year. Um, that's going to tell you where to fish, and it's going to tell you how to fish. And so uh, it'll answer questions like, do you want numbers at the start of the year, or do you want a big fish at the start of the year? Uh, those two answers are often very distinctly different um, in the first weeks of the season. So we'll talk about uh, musky behavior and how to answer those questions. <clears throat> um, some years the muskies aren't ready to play when the musky season open, opens. This year, I predict, my bold prediction is that they will be strong, thick, and active, and ready to go from day one. So if you stay tuned tonight, we'll tell you why that's the case. And we'll tell you how to take maximum advantage of this golden opportunity. Uh, our guest tonight, a panel, we have uh, uh, Mike Spratt, partner uh, in crime at Muskie Factory Baits. We have Mike Kadura here. Ooh, Lisa Goodyear is gonna jump in and out. We have Muskies Canada, past president, Hall of Famer, Muskie Factory uh, guide, Peter Levick here to talk spring conditions with us. So um, very interesting. And then we have a new age video celebrity uh, named James, who's gonna come out and show us some amazing footage that he's gathered um, this spring. He's got, he's got a muskie addiction and uh, you're gonna get to see what exactly that means. On Ask the Biologist, Dr. Sean Landsman is taking an hour or two off from uh, parental duties this evening. We're so grateful that he's back to join us again. He's going to talk about uh, VHS and lymphosarcoma, um, two diseases that get active in the spring. We see a lot of lymphosarcoma around here on the Ottawa and even more on the Rideau. So let's learn about that. One thing that's going to happen really fast this year uh, we're going to talk water temperatures as part of our condition analysis for the start of the year. Um, the water's hot already, and it's going to go to a crazy hot place pretty quick this year. Do muskies seek thermal refuge? What is thermal refuge? Lots of fish do. Um, we're going to answer that question with Dr. Sean, and uh, that's going to tell you a little bit more about how you want to amend um your activities this spring to catch more and to look after your fish better. So a super busy evening tonight. Um, thank you as always the listener. Uh, it's your last chance to ask questions. You've got a panel of people here, um, send them in. And even if you're watching this later um, uh, uh, on the Musky Factory YouTube channel um, or you're watching it next Thursday, whatever, send in your questions. We still go back, we still answer them. We've answered all questions all season long. It's in the thousands. I'm very pleased to say that. Um, thanks to the team, as always. You're going to see them in a minute, so I don't have to say much more about them. Thanks to Shimano, 100 years strong, a big part of my fishing um, my fishing life. Proud to be on the Shimano team. Andre Lalonde, Crestliner Boats, Mercury Motors. I 
got my new 150 this week and I've been too busy to put it in the water. So coming up quickly, we're going to talk about Suic lures because Mike Kadura, one of his favorite baits is is a, a, a weagle, a Suic weagle. And I'm going to talk about Chaos Tackle's Big Mama because that's my favorite top water. So in the spring, those are baits you need. We thank Sale, Canada's Outdoor Superstore, as always. Dan Fulbert in Manatic Bait and Tackle, uh, the newest retailer carrying Muskie Factory baits. Go and say hi to Dan for us. We thank Muskies Canada, as always. We love Muskies Canada so much that we give $2 from every Muskie Factory bait sold directly to research through Muskies Canada. Um, thanks for everything they do, sport, fishing, and research. They are the champions uh, of the muskie world for the muskies and for the muskie fishery. Uh, muskie Symposium, we talked about that. Um, still reverberating around the muskie world. This year, Lisa broke all the video down, so you don't have a six-hour presentation. You have all the individual segments of Dr. Stephen Cook, Dr. Sean Landsman, Jordana Bergman, Mike Parker, um, Doug Wagner, uh, Brent Bochak, all broken down into individual seminars. So great content on the Musky Factory YouTube channel. Please subscribe if, if you haven't already. And another good reason to subscribe is this is episode 20. We're done here in the Musky Monday seminar series, but our YouTube channel is going to host um, the Musky Monday fishing report, Musky report. Not sure what we're going to call it yet, but every week we're going to break down conditions out there. Um, Lisa and I are both uh, uh, ready to get a lot of video. Our boats are set up this year, and uh, and James um, James is going to produce some video for us. After you see what he did in a few minutes, you will be amazed. And I can't wait to uh, to work with you going through the season, James. So we're all set up. Catch the latest and greatest on the Muskie Factory YouTube channel. Um, Ask the Biologist with Dr. Sean Landsman. Um, this one of my highlights on this program. I can get a little bit sentimental. It's the last week. Um, you know, all my dreams came true. Everybody that I wanted to, to talk on this show came here and presented this idea to Sean about Ask the Biologist early and wow um so much great response so much fun and so much personal learning um you know through sean and ask the biologist so let's get him out here so he can give us another musky lesson um hey sean wow you're looking look you you're looking like a new dad that got a little bit of sleep this week i i did she's actually blessed us with uh let's see last night was three or four hours straight uh, the night before was four hours straight. Like we're we're able to piece together, uh, we're able to piece together, a, you know, a full night's sleep. Uh, so we're we're very fortunate. We're doing really well. Maggie's doing great, uh, and uh, yeah, can as 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 a new father, I couldn't ask for anything more. Wow, so, fantastic! Yeah. Congratulations and uh, thanks. Good um, thing. Teach us. So before I teach, if anyone out there has a new like a newborn or a, a toddler looking for something to read their kids uh hedrick because he has a little grandson hedrick wachelka one of our previous guests uh who always gets fishing related and musky related books he wanted this for christmas and his his daughter sent uh sent him that book among others but I, when he told me about that book, I, I had to buy it immediately. So knowing that we were having one of our own. So also want to give a shout out to my Grammy Ree. My grandma is watching. Hi, Grammy Ree. Uh, she's Grammy. hanging out with my parents at home. And uh, of course, John, when you said Big Mama uh, Topwater Baits, that's one of my favorites right there. Oh. Uh, that, that got some fish last year, including uh, some early season fish. I got a cannonball on the way. I got a Lake X Lures uh, cannonball on the way, and I'm really eager to try that out. But I'm a, I'm a big topwater junkie. So, me too. Most yeah. fun you can have catching muskies right there. You got it. You got it. So, all right. Uh, we can go ahead and get into this. Lisa, if you want to flip over to my screen here. There we go. All right. Before we actually get into it, right before I, I logged on to, uh, to StreamYard, I saw on Twitter a, uh, a master student at Bemidji State, Camden Glade, 
uh, he had posted this picture. He's doing a diet study on uh, on muskies in, in Minnesota. And that's a 13 inch bullhead in the mouth of a 40 inch muskie in like two years, almost to the date or day or maybe to the day. Uh, they uh, they got another muskie like two years ago, also with a bullhead in its mouth, about 43 inches uh, long was that muskie. But this, a 13 inch bullhead and a 40 inch muskie, that's over 30% of the fish's body length. Uh, and so this is a freshly coughed up uh, muskie. So when they got it in the net, uh, it, uh, it, it coughed it up. So it was like super fresh. You can tell by the coloration on the bullhead that it, it doesn't, it hardly looks decomposed at all. So anyway, I thought that was cool. Figured folks would uh, be interested in, in this. All right. So we're going to talk about uh, some kind of, I guess, sort of random topics in as water temperatures warm. I didn't really know what else to call uh, today's Ask the Biologist segment. Um, but a couple of things come to mind when I think about warming water temperatures um, and springtime in, in, in general. Um, one of them is uh, lymphosarcoma and just the, the prevalence of, of disease that we sometimes uh, see uh, around this time of year. Um, and then just changes in the fish's behavior as we proceed with the you know, the warming water temperatures through spring as we get into the summer peak. Um, so John had uh, had texted me earlier today and and, and asked me a, a question about thermal re refugia or thermal refuges. Um, and uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a minute too. But lymphosarcoma is one of these weird diseases that uh, can often affect isakids like pike and muskies. That picture there on the top right I actually pulled that off of Ottawa's 613 Fishing, their Facebook group. Uh, someone had posted this recently of a pike they caught in the area. Uh, and there were <laughs> some pretty funny comments likening it to meatballs and, and uh, other nastiness. Uh, cauliflower, I think, was one of the things they had mentioned. But anyway, um, <clears throat> it reminded me that at this time of year, we may start to see more fish, especially pike and muskies with these sarcomas on them, these tumors. So lymphosarcoma is, is caused by a, a virus. Uh, it's actually a type of retrovirus. Um, I, for those that um, want maybe something similarly found in humans, uh, it would be the HIV uh, is a type of retrovirus. It's found naturally in waterways. Um, and uh, lymphosarcoma itself is characterized by malignant tumors. Um, so this virus is, is thought to cause a cancer within the fish. And then these tumors are kind of the outward signs uh, of the virus in the body. And so they're just basically you know, cancerous growths. Um, there's some uh, uh, confusion sometimes about how lymphosarcoma actually gets transmitted um, in, uh, in waterways. Um, it's often transmitted through what's called horizontal transmission. So that is like contact uh, side, you know, from fish touching each other, particularly during the spawning season, as opposed to vertical transmission, which would be something that gets deposited through the eggs or, or milt as it goes vertically in the water column down to the bottom, gets into the waterway that way. In this case, this virus is, is occurring naturally. The fish have the virus in their bodies. Um, there's, uh, usually as the water temperatures start to fall in the autumn or winter, you start to see those grow, those, those tumors begin growing again. And then when those fish come together in the spring to spawn, they touch each other and pass the virus off during the spawning season. Uh, eventually those, those tumors can actually kind of slough off or regress. Uh, so during the summer, Fish that may have had those tumors in the spring might might not have like these those big growths like you see on that on that pike there in the summer. You might see maybe a scar, um, but then uh, then they'll come back usually like in the next the next spring. Um, now, one of the things that that anglers will sometimes ask me, I, I got a, an email from someone recently about this. Uh, and on that 613 fishing page, people are like, well, what, what can we do? There's not really anything that you can do. Um, it, again, it's natural. It's a naturally occurring virus in the water. Um, 
you know, there's really not much you can do once it's in a, in a system, it's kind of there and it's, and it's there to stay. Um, people were asking, well, can we just sacrifice those fish and just dispose of them? You can't, you can't do that. Um, uh, on, you know, first of all, it's kind of unethical to harvest a fish, even if it's of legal size and then not use it just throw it in the trash, for example. Um, so, you know, your best bet is to really just leave it. Um, it will either die naturally on its own or it can survive for some period of time, just like humans can live with cancers uh, for, for some period of time. And uh, uh, those fish may still be able to spawn successfully. And, and uh, just because they may come in contact with another, uh, with another fish during the spawning season doesn't necessarily mean that that other fish is going to, uh, is going to get, uh, get, uh, get the virus, okay? So I would just say, you know, unfortunately, just let the fish go um, and, and hope for the best. The other one that we, the other kind of disease that we, we see flare up sometimes in the spring, there hasn't been a really big outbreak of it to my knowledge uh, in, in recent memory, um, but VHS or viral hemorrhagic septicemia virus. Um, and of course, many of you know already have heard about VHS, um, particularly as it relates to the St. Lawrence River uh, musky population that took a really big hit um, kind of around 2007, 2008, uh, maybe between 2005 to 2008. Um, it was, uh, the, the virus was first discovered uh, in the Great Lakes in 2005 and, and in muskies in 2005. Actually in muskies, uh, it was from a fish that was collected in 2003, but that the virus wasn't actually uh, identified until 2005. Um, VHS it has like a global distribu distribution as a virus, and there's tons of different strains out there. It occurs in the marine environment, it occurs in the fresh and freshwater environment, it occurs occurs all over the place. The Great Lakes actually has its own strain that is, seems to have adapted to the Great Lakes itself. Um, what you you tend to find are fish uh, that will appear just off uh, or or have outward signs of, of hemorrh hemorrhaging. So there, there's going to be some internal bleeding as well as some dermal hemorrhaging like you see on that on that shad in the bottom right there. Uh, this virus is highly contagious. Uh, there's a reason uh, there still is and for after this virus was first identified uh, in the Great Lakes, um, there was like an immediate ban on on transporting fish across borders. Uh, in states, um, it was hard to source fish from outside of states for 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 stocking purposes. Um, even fish that were captured from uh, the Great Lakes on the Ontario side, that uh, broodstock or and and or eggs that would have been delivered to the states for their restoration and stocking purposes, um, those fish were prevented from going across the border. Uh, in order to, uh, and eggs were prevented from going across the border in order to slow the spread of VHS. So it's been around for a while. It does seem to, uh, it does seem to affect muskies um, more so than, than a lot of other species. Although that said, it is found in a ton of, of freshwater fish species, but muskies appear to be a pretty strong reservoir. There also seems to be um, some uh, some 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 evidence that that the virus will actually affect larger and older fish, which uh, came out of some research on the on the St. Lawrence by Dr. Castleman. Um, VHS transmission it occurs naturally in the water, um, uh, potentially through contact, uh, similar to lymphosarcoma, particularly during the spawning season. Flare-ups can occur in the spring, so. Um, you know, this is a this is a stressful time period for the fish. They've just gone through the spawning process. They've had to allocate a lot of energy to uh, reproduction. Their the amount of energy that they're able to allocate to um, you know keeping up their immune system may not be as strong as it would be at other times of the year. So they're susceptible. Sus excuse me, susceptible. Oh my god, susceptible. There we go. I'll blame that on, on sleep Four and, hours and sleep. the baby, yeah. <laughs> um, they're susceptible to uh, disease and, and things like that at this time of year. So VHS does not appear to be dangerous to humans, um, just as a kind of an FYI. Um, but yeah, you know, if you're in a, if you're in a, a waterway that has um, 
VHS in it. There's you know no known known reservoirs of VHS within a particular body of water you may have been fishing. Do your best to like let your boat at least thoroughly dry in the sun for a while or clean it off before going into another body of water. Okay. Uh, thermal tolerance. So this is where we're going to get into a bit of thermal ref uh, refuge talk here. Um, so what can we say about thermal tolerance? Well, freshwater fishes are often grouped into what are called temperature guilds or temperature groups. So you've got your cold water fish species like trout, lake trout, for example, and cisco, cool water species like muskies and pike, and then your warm water species like your, your largemouth bass and, and some of your, your sunfish species. The, to um, the, the tolerance of, of warm water varies among, uh, among these species. Um, and uh, for muskies, their optimal temperatures and the temperature range is in, in, in and around the mid high 70s. So muskies can tolerate warm water better than other species for sure. Again, it's going to be very species specific, but there's, there's still a point where uh, they may not feel comfortable if the water gets too warm. And so this is where we, we enter into this whole discussion about thermal refuge. Uh, a thermal refuge is really kind of any area of a water body that provide, provides shelter. Um, often in, in this context, we're talking about cool water and it also needs to have ample oxygen. Um, but this refuge um, is, uh, this provides refuge from warm water temperatures. The same can occur during the winter where fish may seek out areas of warmer water to escape really cold water. We're talking about thermal refuge. Um, you might recall, I actually touched on this a little bit during my, my discussion about climate change um, with, a, with the example of ciscos, which are cold water species. As we get into uh, a future where, where temperatures will warm and we're already seeing warming water temperatures, what happens is you constrict the amount of uh, thermal refuge uh, habitat um, within a body of water. As, uh, as that water warms and more of the water column is warm, species that need to seek refuge from that, from that warm water will find less and less of a body of water that's within their kind of preferred temperature range. But in the context of muskies, do muskies use thermal refugia? And the, the answer to this is likely yes, though it's maybe not as pronounced as it would be for other species. And that's just a function of uh, muskies being able to tolerate warmer water more so than other species. Um, there also appears to not be any real direct evidence of this where people have gone out and tracked fish into known areas of like thermal, uh, thermal, you know, a thermal refuge of some sort. Um, or if they're tracking them around, they may not necessarily have like a temperature sensor on the tag. So they might, you know, not really know exactly where within a water column uh, the fish might be. So it's more of circumstantial evidence. We think they're in these locations at these times of years, uh, at the, this time of, a, of the year, in order to seek out thermal refuge habitat. It's a lot of that kind of talk uh, within the literature. Um, but a, a thermal refuge could look like deep water. So as we kind of saw back uh, in this diagram here, so you've got this thermal refuge. So if this is the summer, we've got a lot of warm water in the kind of upper layers of, of the of a water body. And then we've got this cooler zone toward the bottom uh, and then in this deeper water. And so that could that could act as a thermal refuge. You might also have colder tributaries coming into a river. And this is an example from Anchor River in Alaska. Uh, this would be for salmon. But you can see like these little tributaries here feeding into the main river. The purple there is cold water. And the rest of the, the main river stem is that you know, bright red there, uh, so much warmer water. Uh, these might also be zones of groundwater upwelling. So anyone that's fishing, uh, fishing rivers um, might be aware of some areas where there's springs coming up uh, in the, from, from the river bottom. And so that would often bring much cooler water, especially during the summer, uh, and would serve as, as some thermal uh, refuge. So that's all. I could probably ramble on for a while longer, um, but I, I definitely want to say 
that I had a ton of fun this, uh, I don't know, when did we start this, John? January, February? January, um, yeah. Yeah. Long yeah. time and ago. It feels like it's ages ago, yeah. But I had a lot of fun, a lot of, lot of, lot of fun uh, fielding emails from people and coming on the show. And I, and I hope uh, over the last 20 episodes, uh, folks have, have learned something. So, um, Gosh, it's been a pleasure having you here week after week. Um, I know you've taught the audience a lot. You've, you've taught me an incredible amount. And you're such a great representative of the New Age science community because you're addicted to muskies and being out on the water and the fishing side of it. And, and then, you know, the, the, the in-class, the deep research, meticulous study side of it. All, all of that is, is, is in you. You humanize it. Um, you make it understandable for all of us. And uh, yeah, the feedback just, just says everything. So thank you very, very much for being here all of this time. Um, I gotta leave you with two or three comments just on on your presentation tonight, because um, we always uh, 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 go back and forth a little bit. Forty inch musky with a thirteen inch big fat bullhead in its mouth at a time of year when a lot of people are downsizing baits. Hmm. Yeah, so it's funny you say that because I almost thought about mentioning something uh, in, uh, in that regard because. Camden, actually, there's a small group of us that uh, have, have met on the side back, back in like February, March, um, where we have like a Zoom Zoom presentation thing and then just a discussion. Uh, and Camden came on to one of these special little things. And uh, we a bunch of us got to talking about, yeah, like bait, bait size in the spring. Um, personally, I'm not a big I'm not a big believer in downsizing to like you know a, a, a four inch bait or a six inch bait. No. I'm not a real big believer no. in that. And to me, this is just like you know proof in the pudding here that uh, you know if there's big enough prey out there, they're gonna they're gonna go for that. I don't really I don't really know where the whole we got you got a downsize in the spring thing came from. Um, so you know, not sure. Maybe it's people that are thinking, well, there's gonna be a lot of you know, one-year-old fish uh, that might be available to muskies up in the shallows or something like that. But, you know, I, I maybe. Um, certainly not YOY since most things around our region uh, will be spawning in the spring. And so the YOY would be available more so in the fall. So, yeah, there might be some one-year-old prey fish like perch or bluegill or whatever. Um but a muskie's gonna have to eat a lot of those and expend a lot of en a lot of energy eating all those little species, little prey species up. Um, whereas they could just you know gulp down a ten inch perch, sucker, thirteen inch bullhead, and get quite uh, quite the meal out of that in, in one fell swoop. So, um, absolutely. Um, the VHS. Uh, it's funny how VHS keeps coming up. Doug Wagner brought it up last week. They missed two years of being Stop. able to, to put small muskies yeah. into Wisconsin. And that happened to Dr. Farrell with Syracuse University and an entire crop of muskies, Destin uh, um, um, seven, eight inch muskies um, that were destined for the St. Lawrence as well. So, you know, really pertinent yeah. disease that, that just keeps coming back in the muskie world year after year. Yeah. Um, neat stuff. Uh, the, 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 you know, that small lure thing that started by Americans, most of my Americans, um, all downsize in the spring, they're fishing for American size muskies. We're fishing for Canadian size muskies. So downsizing. Shots fired. <laughs> not, not that big, not that, not that big a deal up here. And Gord Pizer said his whole life that he doesn't believe in downsizing in the spring. And then last year he said, yeah, he gets it. He starts to downsize. So I'm conflicted. I don't I know. know. Me I too. Gotta, Me I too. Because I, I have, I, I will also downsize a little bit, but yeah, I'm doing it less and less and less. So yeah. Yep, I agree. So um, thank you so much for all of this, Sean. Um, a pleasure. You get a good night's sleep, and Thanks. we'll talk to you again soon, my friend. All um, right. Sounds good, John. Take care. Take care. Um, wow, what a pleasure hanging out with Sean for all of this time. I am so much wiser for my time with him. Um, I'm going to ramble for 
two minutes and then we're going to bring a really special guest out. I'm going to bring Lisa out to introduce you to a young man with a serious musky problem. But he's putting his musky problem to really good use and all of us are going to benefit um, from his newfound addiction. And so um, what happens in the spring, um, all of our fishing seasons are designed in Ontario because our system is based on natural reproduction, on constant recruitment every year. So our seasons are designed to open two weeks after our fish are done spawning in a normal year. And that gives a two week window so that if it's a bad spring and temperatures don't rise as fast and your fish spawn later, that your fish have still had a successful spawn. And you know, that's what makes the Ottawa so good. 13 dams, consistent water levels, successful spawn every year. And that's why we have um, the fish that we do. You have three possibilities that can happen um, every spring. Um, you can have an early spring where the spawn happens early and that dictates behavior. You can have the normal spawn um, when the fish are finished two weeks before the season and that's one set of conditions to address or you can have a late spring um, and cold temperatures and retarded weed growth and those are three completely different scenarios for you to address as a muskie angler. And they all mean different attitude, different aggression, and the fish are at different stages in their recuperation from spawning. So um, a really good way to, uh, to know where you are for a year is to look at your logs. And so that's why you keep logs. That's why you keep Muskies Canada logs. Um, they're there forever. You can go back and look at how you did and not make the same mistakes and you can um, match up years. So one of the things we're gonna do today is we're gonna look at the last four years, 17, 18, 19, and 20, and what those conditions were, what's most, uh, most relatable to 2021. Um, and activity and aggression there. So activity and aggression depends on where you are in the spawn. Um, James, our, uh, our young man with a musky problem, Lisa, if you wanna come out and give James an appropriate introduction and he's got some really incredible video that displays different stages of uh, recuperation and spawning going on right now out there. Yeah, for sure. So I had the pleasure of meeting James uh, last year for the first time. His mom booked a, a half day charter, and you know it was pretty apparent he'd never caught well, he'd never caught a muskie. Obviously, uh, it, was, it was a gift for him, but it was so apparent to me so quickly that this kid, and I say kid only because I'm old. He's he's 16, but uh, <laughs> he'd uh, he'd done his research. You know, like I have never had someone come so prepared for a charter who's never uh, caught a muskie. Um, so that was, it was really cool to see like right away. There was just a, another level of passion there. And we actually, we had a pretty good day on the water. We had, I think we had three shots and uh, another really cool thing. The first time I've ever handed someone uh, a rod with a suic on it, one demo, his first cast, he moved a muskie with a suic. So that was, that was pretty cool. We had our shots. It didn't work out, uh, but I got him out in the boat later in the year and he got his first muskie. It was a very special moment for me and for him. Um, but yeah, he's, he's taken his passion to another level. He's now a member of, uh, our, our Ottawa Muskies Canada chapter, which is awesome. And he's doing some very cool things. So I'd like to, to bring him out to, uh, to talk to you about that. All right. So I'll start off by talking a bit about my skills and what, what I'm doing. So I'm a certified SSI scuba diver for open water certification with also wreck diving and perfect buoyancy and nitrox courses, which essentially allows me to dive down to 60 feet. Haven't done any scuba diving yet. The water is too cold for me to be going down that deep yet. But <laughs> so um, my goals for this year for filming muskies is so I wanna try to film muskies spawning, which I may have done. So you may be <laughs> able to see that. Um, also, I wanna film them in their natural habitat during summertime. So like what they're doing in the weed beds also their reaction to different types of lures, like do they always swallow it if they see it, or do they kind of follow it then go, leave it alone and then come back? And then also, what do they do after they've been released? Do they go down to the bottom and sit there, or do they swim around a bit? Awesome. All right, so let's uh, let's show the first video. So, and I think it's important to tell people, you know, 
your goal was to film a muskie and I was shocked at how quickly <laughs> you were able to do that. It's phenomenal. And these two videos, most people would spend years trying to accomplish and you managed to accomplish it in less than a week. Uh, so let's show the first one and we'll talk a little bit about it. Super cool, they even posed for you. Yeah, so what essentially happened there is, so I went out to Tweed, which if, if people knows where that is, good on you, I don't expect you to. It's kind of near Peterborough, if you know where that is. Um, so I went down there because I've been, ke I remember seeing on an app I have fish brain that people have caught muskies there earlier on in the season. So I'm like, hey, maybe I can film them. So I go down there. There's this lower rapidy area, so I swim around there for probably about a 40 minutes to an hour. Don't see anything, but I filmed a lot of little perch in that. So I'm getting out of the water. I'm freezing cold because it's a river and it's early May. So and then my dad's like, "Hey, you should go over there, like and and see what's over there." So I I walk over there at first with just my boots on, and I hear this like kind of like splash, and I see this thing dart off, and I'm like, "Oh, I just missed my chance." That sucks. But then, so I put on my mask. I'm just like, okay, maybe I'll still be there. And so I go down into the water. And then, so I'm filming the perch and all that stuff. And I turn my head and it's staring right at me. And the first thing that goes through my mind is thinking about how I've heard that muskies have attacked people. I'm like, this does not look good. <laughs> but then it managed, then it turned around. And then I was able to just sit next to it and just watch it for about five minutes before I decided to get out. Fantastic. How how long was that fish, do you think, James? Well, when I when I first looked at it, I was like, oh my God, this thing is massive. But now when I'm looking back at it, I think it was maybe like 30 inches or so. Granted, I've only caught one muskie in my life, so I'm probably <laughs> not the best judge of size on things. But it was it was definitely not big fish class. Like it was small. I yeah, think. and one one of the things they tell you when they're taking your scuba course is everything looks one third larger yeah. under the water. So you yeah. have to, that, that's why every diver has stories about six foot muskies under, underwater. And you know, that's cause it's all one, one third, one third bigger. Um, fantastic. I, I want to tell you that, um, as soon as I turned 16, I went out and got my Naui scuba certification so that I could go and look at fish underwater. And one of the first places I dove out outdoors was uh, White Lake Bridge on the head pond of the Madawaska. My instructor, Bruce Bowen, in 1977. Wow, man. Can't believe my brain still works on stuff like that. <laughs> Took us out for an open water dive there. And um, I saw big pike around on the bottom there. And it was just a dream come true. The head pond of the Madawaska, lots of muskies and clear water. Good place to dive, too. Um, that fish, to me, looked exactly like... A, a small male muskie in spring. You could see the scar. The fish was skinny, and it was beat up. And you could see the scars on it. It had been tussling and fighting. Um, the males are, you know, there's there's an aggression going on in the spring, and the bigger fish get to spawn. And so that fish was lethargic. It had no energy. It it you know was bearing the scars of of being a smaller male muskie, having a rough time in the spring and probably very little interest in um, eating. I actually saw those fish or a fish just like that when I was out with Kent Rose on um, in the Long Island stretch of Echo Lands last spring. And we watched a small male muskie in the low 30 inch range sitting in a tree that um, just was beat up, didn't want to participate in life, was just, just, you know stationary recuperating so um wow what a fantastic how how long did it take you to get that how many well days? so i started first the first week of may i went to the jock river landing and i kind of swam up there like my first time so i wasn't really 100 percent what i was supposed to do didn't see anything and then next a week or so later i went back there and i was a little bit more prepared and i swam up it more still didn't see anything but that weekend, I was like, okay, maybe we can go try Tweed, not expecting to see anything. And then I saw that. Wow. Fantastic. Um, and what do you have? You got a video today, did you? 
Yeah, so um, after um, seeing that one, and I've also been doing some diving at Brewer's Park, which I've done and I've seen some muskies there. And I've also, when I went down there, I've saw that there's a ton of trash down there. So I tried my best to try to clean some of that up. And that's what I've got in in a couple of days. So I've gotten a bunch of tires and I found a bunch of old musky baits. So if anybody lost any lures there, I may have one. And then I also went out a couple of days ago and I found this lure that Sean lost um, last year. And so that was kind of fun. Water there is so murky that I did not want to stay there for very long. But And also because someone told me that there was giant snapping turtles there. And so when I can only see just in front of my face, I did not want to be reaching down there for stuff like that. So I have my limits. And then so today I went out there. I woke up at 6 in the morning because my dad needed to get back to make dinner. So we got out there. Um, I looked down and I saw muskies in the water. So I'm like, okay, this is good. And then, so I got down in the water and I saw this. Play that again. Could you please, Lisa? <laughs> And again, you see, fan, fantastic. How deep of water are you in right there? Well, right there, it was probably about um, a foot because so like that area. So like there's a dam there. And so there's like kind of this little like weedy bay. And so I was in the weedy bay and I was just kind of lying down on the weeds and just coming, kind of filming out into there. But in the area where they were actually spawning, I'm imagining it was probably around like a couple, like 10 feet or so. And then they were coming up there to rest and whenever and that kind of thing. Fantastic. Great. And that was, uh, again, a smaller pair of muskies, a little bit bigger than you were looking at before, maybe mid 30 inch range, you think? Yeah. And then the smaller one underneath it, actually, when we were leaving, we saw that, um, I didn't get a video of it, but, um, the smaller one actually got kicked off the, the other one by a bigger one. And so there was two bigger ones that were sitting next to each other after that. Yeah, and that's that's the males again fighting. It's a it's a rough time of year. And again, you know, those the muskies that you showed us had scars from the battle, from the rubbing, from the, you know, uh, from the rough time through the spring. So, um absolutely fantastic. Um uh, I love love your new addiction and I love that you've already checked off one of your bucket list yeah. uh, items and it's it's may at the start of the year so um can't wait to see what else you get for video um to where this goes with you and to work with you on producing some really neat video this summer so uh fantastic yeah. james can't really, wait really Thank cool you, really cool all the best right <laughs> right absolutely wow just awesome. just just love that enthusiasm and passion and 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 not just talk not just uh, uh, talking the talk walking mm -hmm. the walk out there in the river swimming with the snapping turtles yeah <laughs> yeah that takes some courage for sure <laughs> well done fantastic James um, all right without further ado I guess it's time to bring out our panel and tell you all how to be successful at the start of the year. Um, from the opening day on, so uh, a, a, a an experienced and studied group of anglers we have tonight. Mike Spratt, somebody I've been fishing with for 30 years. He's had the addiction his whole life. He's from uh, Musky Factory Worldwide Assembly Headquarters in <laughs> downtown Ottawa. Um, nice to see you, Mike. Can't... How's it going, guys? Fantastic. Um Second on the panel, um, fifth year Musky Factory Baits Guide and uh, uh, awesome bait maker as well in his own right. We've been training him hard, working him hard. Mike Kadura. Hey, Mikey. 
Hey, I love, thanks for letting me in. That was a great video. That's awesome, that kid, man. Another new hero for my for me. Yeah, yeah. He's 16. Let's see where that let's see where that passion goes to. And then wow, to complete a panel tonight, Lisa's gonna run away because she didn't want to do that with us. And so she's gonna sub out and she's gonna slide in. Um Longtime Muskies Canada, Ottawa president, chapter president, longtime national president, Muskies Canada Hall of Famer, organizer of the last two Odysseys, a guide for the Ottawa River Muskie Factory, and something else you need to know about Peter Levick, um, Peter's wonderful wife, Maria, and my stepdaughter, Mode, both play in the same awesome band called L'Echo de l'Acadie, and if you want to have a really neat... Uh, francophonie cultural experience check out that band one of these days so without further ado peter levick and the panel is complete hey, hey. That's, that's not peter levick wait wait a minute wait a minute I, <laughs> that's not peter levick peter levick has a white beard he's got a belly like santa claus he looks way older than you what, well, it's hopefully fun. this is the post-COVID, Peter, so we'll see how all of that goes. But uh, great to be here. And what an inspiration to see James and his videos. I, you know, I think this is the time of year that we've, we, we all have musky fever, like really badly. Uh, we've been waiting, especially this past year, it's been a really rough one. So we, everybody shares that passion to get out there. He's beaten us to it in a really wonderful way with his camera. So... I really, really appreciate what he's doing. James, you're amazing. And yeah. uh, you're an inspiration to all of us. It's really yes. great. Here, here. Yeah, we just had rod and reels where we'd grown up. Now you can go out and actually chase them around <laughs> through the camera in the water, you know. It's yeah. amazing, this evolution. Um, tonight, if you're out there listening, send in your questions. We'll get them up. I'm going to throw questions out to these guys, and we're all going to participate throw our answers in accordingly and we're going to start by asking what have you guys seen out on the river this spring how did spring unfold peter you live on the uh, uh ottawa river what do you see give us some observations well you know it, it, it's been a strange year because uh, i live on a bay off of the ottawa and it was the latest ice melt ever that we had it was april the 6th you know usually it's it's earlier than that but when the ice goes off the bay uh but since then it's been warm weather all the way through it's we've had it's been sunny it's been warm uh, the, uh there's been you know people in swimming uh not necessarily with scuba suit protection and that kind of thing so i think uh it, it's it's interesting to see what the climate has given us over the last four weeks or so and i think that that's had a big acceleration factor on what's happening in the whole aquatic ecosystem uh you know in addition to that uh you know we're, we're over on 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 this side of the river uh we've been able to see more boats perhaps than on the ontario side i live on the quebec side and marinas and boat launches have been open during this last few weeks, whereas there's been some restrictions and constraints about boating and boat launches and uh, marinas being open. Uh, it's been a big issue for the Ontario Sports Fishing Guides Association to try and get um, uh, the ability so that you know guides can get out on the water to do their thing uh, because it's a really important part of the industry. So we've seen, a, on this side, we've seen quite a bit of boat activity that's, that's happening. Um, and I think if we, uh, you know, if, if, if we go back to James's video of the last one with the two fish that were together, they're presumably spawning, uh, where were they? There were some weeds right there. So, you know, I think what's probably happening is we're gonna see really nice, maybe a bit earlier than usual development in uh, the, the, the weed areas, and there's some species that come up quicker, uh, you know, uh, Richardson pondweed or, uh, you know, some of those uh, uh, species uh, of weeds are, are up earlier, whereas some of the others fill in later on. And that's one of the things that I love about the beginning of the season is that there's lots of shallow weed, almost free area, not quite, just new weeds starting to grow, and then there's these clumps of curly cabbage that are, are fish magnets. 
uh, as, as things get defined. So I just, you know, one of the things that we're always looking for at this time of year is where are the weeds? How are the weeds doing? Are they more than last year, less than last year at this time? Uh, because our fish, they relate to weeds a lot. Yeah, in the spring, the two biggest factors that determine activity are temperature and, and weed growth. And so um, after the ice left, our temperature skyrocketed. Um, I think um, I heard some crazy numbers for temperatures out on the Rideau and the Ottawa. Um, you combine that with uh, really low water, really clear water. Um, weed growth is uh, a product of temperature and light and so clear water you get lots of light penetration it's already a huge year for weeds mike spratt you were out on the water today yeah we were out today we were hunting some gar um i noticed uh, on the main part of the channel when we were when we were approaching our spot the water was 65 degrees which is still way warmer than i was expecting um but we, we were in the the back bays um and it was quite swampy um, thick weeds right to the surface, uh, some points where you had to use a paddle because uh, the trolling motor wouldn't get through them. Um, and uh, it was reading, the highest reading I got was 78 degrees in those back days on May 2-4. That's, that's unheard of. Uh, have you ever got those temperatures in May out on the river before anybody? No. No, no, me, me no. either. I mean, there's some years where we get to the start of musky season, which is still a few weeks away, and there's zero weeds, and we're still in the 50 degree, you know, in the in the mid to upper 50s, you know. So to, to have these temperatures for early May, amazing. Um, Mike Kadura, what do you what did you see this spring? Well, what I saw was a lot of a lot of nice rain and uh, and some warmer weather, and then we got some cooler weather. It seemed kind of like a mix, but I'd say overall, the else is seeing. You know, it's like things get pushed back uh, or I guess move forward in terms of the spring summer transition. You know, I mean, I I feel like we kind of had a spring this year. Um, and the last couple of days has been a little cooler. We had a real cool night last night, but just from looking around in nature and the birds and when they show up and when the plants really start growing and when you can put your garden in, when you can put your flowers in, you know, just in the general environment, we're getting an extended summer as the years go by, which of course means a lot more, more water, warmer water temperatures. And with the low water this year and the sun penetration we had as quickly as we have, I expect to be full on weed beds out there on the water as soon as the season opens and those fish are going to be ready to go from the beat right from the beginning which is great <laughs> in, in a lot of ways you know as long as they can spawn and it doesn't get too too warm absolutely i mean there's years where there's years where if it's a, a late spring the fish are still spawning and then they go through a recuperation and then they're more catchable and so you know, opening day comes and the fish aren't ready to play with us. There's a right. few fish caught. Um, in those situations, the males and the females are are acting differently. The males are still in the spawning beds. Um, um, they tend to wait in the spawning beds. They stay there longer. The females visit. They go in and out. And when they're done, they head out to deeper water to recuperate. So, you know, this year... Uh, the spawn is going to be done. I mean, the spawn is going to be long done. Um, what's that going to do for you on opening day? Peter, what are you going to do? Well, I think on opening day, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, get out there and having checked the weeds, I'm going to try and find that the clumpy early weed growth uh, where you've got a cluster of weeds that starts to come up uh, before everything gets weeded in later in the summer. Those first emergent weeds that are really visible, uh, those are, are great places to start to work uh, for casting. I mean, you, you wanna work them uh, across and around the top of the weeds, you wanna go around the sides, you wanna drop some things around the edges of the weeds if there's fish underneath, but that's from a casting point of view. From a trolling point of view, same thing is gonna happen uh, with respect to the weeds that we'll see that have all grown in later on in the year are just getting started now. So they're down, they might be up, uh, you know, a, a foot 
in, in four or five feet of water. Uh, those are great areas to troll and put something on like, a, like a, you know, an inline spinner. Uh, and, you know, I, it, 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 things work really well trolling, uh, covering some area because, as you say, John, the fish are moving around a little bit. They haven't set up yet on their summer area. Exactly. Uh, they, but, you know, they, they, they are, uh, you know, looking at uh, a bit of rest, a bit of recuperation time before they, they really set up on their summer spots. Uh, after the spawn, uh, they're, they're recovering, uh, they're starting to eat. The bait fish around them are starting to behave in certain ways. So you want to find where the food is. Uh, and of course, you know, with the technology we have these days, you know, we can spot fish with side imaging and, and that kind of thing so that we can, uh, we can be a little bit pr pr more precise in our location. Um, can I make a point that picks up on but goes in a slightly different direction than what Sean was talking about. You know, a thermal refuge, I think, is a really interesting concept. At the beginning of the season, at least in my experience, I've found fish in the early part of the season where the water is the warmest. If you're a cold-blooded species and you're dependent on your recovery based on, you, you know, uh, exothermal conditions, um, you're going to probably want to be somewhere where that recovery can be speeded up a little bit by slightly warmer water. So there are a lot of back bays or shallower areas that aren't necessarily spawning areas, but they're great recovery areas when the water's a little warmer before you get to the end of what they can tolerate in terms of, of, of warm water. So that would be one thing that I would look at is really observe water temperature between the main channels and the back, back bays. And what Mike was talking about is a really extreme uh, an interesting example of that this year. So, you know, my thought would be uh, look for weeds, look for warm water uh, and, and see what kind of activity is happening there. Not just for muskies, but for other species and for bait fish. Where's the greatest um, uh, biodiversity happening within the aquatic system? And it's in those shallow, fast warming areas where everything starts to happen. Temperature, absolutely a big deal. Um, in the spring, there's a whole lot of things that influence temperature in different places. Seeking out warm water, big strategy. Let's talk about where you find warm water. So, Mike, you said you said bays. You went, did you when you were hunting gar? So were you looking for warm gar are really, really a warm water fish. You find the warmest water in the spring, you find gar. Where'd you go to find the warmest water? Just very, very far back in base. What side were, of the river? Uh, we were on the Ontario side. On the Ontario side. Yeah. Interesting. Um, the secluded bays on the Ontario side. Why? Well, you, you mentioned earlier where you went, and I won't. Uh, if somebody wants to go back and find that, I won't. I won't uh, give that away again. But typically, the the Quebec side on any body of water, the north side of a system warms up faster. Then the south side. If you look at the angle of the sun, it's in the southern hemisphere. And so it's just much more intense on the shallow waters on the north side of any system. So that's a good place to start to find your warm water. Um, your tributaries warm up faster in the spring than your main water system. So inside your tributaries, at the mouth of your tributaries, and then dirty water. Dirty water warms up much faster than uh, than clear water does as well. So, yeah, shallow north sides of the bays. Um, where are you going on opening day, Mike Kadura? Well, I got some. Uh, I like that 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 idea where the where there's a current, but the there's like eddies, and the water kind of gets stuck up in there, and it's shallow and it's sandier. You know, if I can find an area, I don't necessarily going to go into a bay, although I do like places that are not too far from where I know they they will spawn. But there's some places in my head that I'm already been dreaming about where I know I can go in the spring, and it may not be a bay. But it's a place where 
there's some eddies and the water kind of gets trapped back in there and it's on the north side of the river. So it's on the place that's getting more sun and the bottom's a little darker. I know there'll be some early weeds growing there. So like so many really good fishermen, you know, you want to look for combinations of things and that combination of that. I want musky. I want a musky that's looking to eat and it's not going to be too far away from some current. You know, they're going to sit there and just wait for the food to come to them. So it's a combination. I'll find some, some, some stiller water near where the water is moving and there's some current and it's, and it's warmer water. Like Peter was talking about, that's going to be it. Now this year, because they've already spawned out, a big thing for me is going to be, I'm going to be able to use top waters right away. I'm not going to be using just glide baits like it might be if it was a little colder. So top waters are going to work. Our inlines are going to be working. Our, 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 uh, our uh, hybrids are going to be working, you know, working them through the weeds, working them near the weeds. And that's going to be, so it's almost going to be like that, like typically t two weeks or a week or two into the season after our cup, first couple of trips, I anticipate the first trip of the year being bang on and being able to kind of just go into that summer pattern. You know, I I've gone out some year, one year I went out in the first 13 fish that I caught we're all male muskies. Um, you, you had a really good point a moment ago. You're going to go and fish near the spawning beds. And that's a key because the spawn is going to be done. The fish that are most likely to relate to those areas, which are getting almost weeded out right now. Um, right. You know, Peter mentioned go and fish where the weeds are growing in a lot of places. A lot of times in the shallow places, it's a place that you can fish today. But two days from now, you can't fish it because it's going to get weeded in. And so, you know, the temperature's rising there. The weeds are growing. Um, you know, new weeds mean lots of other fish, lots of other fish around it. Where are our muskies spawning? You said to fish near spawning locations. Where are our muskies spawning on the river? Let's answer that for them. Well, they're going to spawn. They're going to go back into really weedy bays and kind of mucky bottoms, you know? And so uh, there, that, that's, there's some places that, I remember being at, we had an outing and we were at Peter's place and uh, there was a, one of our, one of our Musky Canada guys, he was able to get back into one of those bays where they had spawned and it was a cooler spring and he slayed him. He had like five fish. Remember his partner got the hook in the arm. We won't talk about that part, but he slayed him back. And, and two weeks later, you couldn't go back in that bay. So he got back in there where they spawn and he, they had already spawned out, but they were still hanging around there. And man, did they have a heck of a day. I mean, I, I was really jealous <laughs> to be honest with you. So they're going to spawn back in the bays and the mucky parts, you know, really shallow water. And the, they, that's where I, I've always found it to be. And they will go there every year. They, they will go there, you know, 53 and a half inch fish with Tony Sapiano right after the season opened in a bay where we see him spawning year after year after year. And there's what a year? big female in there. What um, year? That was that was the year before the flood, the first year before the flood, the first flood. 2016. Okay. 2016. Then. That would have been 2016. Yeah. 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 Okay. I think I just started guiding just a year before that or something with you. Okay. Because the flood yeah. years would be different on that. So oh, Mike, completely Mike, different. Mike Spratt, where, where are you finding or where do you see fish spawning? Well, we have the luxury in Ottawa of having two different openers, right? We have the, the, the first Saturday in June, the Rideau is open, the Madawaska is open, right? Um, and so we, we get a couple of weeks before the Ottawa opens. Um, and I find, uh, and I love the Rideau and the early uh, pre-Ottawa opener. I love fishing the Rideau. Um, and for me, the Rito, um, it's those small tributaries. Um, I find that uh, I will always do well at the mouth of those. Um, and I'm never afraid to go up in them and fish the shallows, uh, the, the Rito in particular. Um, and in all sections of the Rito, of course, there's muskies all the way from Ottawa going all the way past, uh, way down past Merrickville. And, um, and, and they, they can all produce that way. Um, but it also depends, um, you know, like you said, it's a, it's a warm year. The fish are going to be coming out of those spaces fairly quickly. Um, and it's going to be a year where we're going to be targeting the weeds. So I would say um, 
I would say that op that those opening days are definitely going to be around the tributaries, uh, staying closest to the weeds, never afraid to work uh, outside in deeper water as well. I've definitely had opening day fish in 12 and 15 feet of water, um, which kind of seems odd, but I feel like they're out there kind of recuperating. Um, in fact, I can think of one opening day tournament way back um, where Devo and I, we got three on opening day, all trolling deeper water. Um, and uh, it was it was very productive. There was not a lot of fish caught in that tournament. And we had we had these, we were doing what other people weren't doing. And I don't know if it was necessarily out of uh, knowledge or just kind of random, but it certainly worked out for us and it was a bit of a wake up. Um, but on the, the Rito, for sure, um, the tributaries are my go-to. Um, and then uh, once the Ottawa opens, I, I still have a great article in, uh, in one of the re release journals. And the, the theme of that article is it's all about good weed. The author did a great job of just picking apart <laughs> the different weeds. I know who wrote that. Picking apart the different weeds and targeting those weeds and finding that early weed growth and the fish are in there. And like you said, hitting spots where you won't be able to fish later in the year. Yeah, well, thanks for giving that author a plug, whoever he may he may be. And you know, in, in, in years where the temperature is cold and the spring is late, your weed growth is retarded. And so first weeds, any weeds that grow in the first weeds, but this year there's gonna be weeds all over the place. You really hit it uh, hit on uh, fishing out in deeper water for the bigger fish off of the weed structures you know those females are done if i look at the biggest fish i've ever caught in the spring a lot of times i mean all your biggest fish are females and it's uh, in the years when they were um, done early and they were re recuperating in the deeper water let's history repeats itself in life apparently and definitely in the musky world and that's why we keep logs um, a lot of things suck about getting older but one of the good things is you got way more logs to look back on and compare things to. So let's just go back a few years, 2017 and 19, two flood years. Um, how were those springs? That was cooler water, uh, late spawn, retarded weed growth. How was fishing in those years? Peter? There was extreme current as well, John, because there was so much water in the system. So everything was faster and so you know I, like i'm thinking about a trip that we did uh in 19 with the you know with the, the, the our, our friends from the states uh fly fishing and it was a real challenge to be able to fly fish to guide for them to be able to do that because the drift is really important and the drift was so fast we had to make a lot of passes but you know we had five fish in two days and uh they had a great time but this was all on the fly but the current and you know mike's point earlier about finding a place where there's backwater or there's eddies or there's a place where the fish don't have to do very much work that was a key to success for us uh you know we worked all around structure uh we found spots where the fish might be tucked right into the weeds or right into again structure that wouldn't be fishable or in around stumps you know there were a variety of different places that we were able to get fish but it was hard to fish particularly that way because you know we're moving and not necessarily running the trolling motor the, the electric motor all the time but you know just using it to control the drift as you go by places that you really want to cast to so you know, if, it's nothing like fly fishing to kind of really fine tune that sense of what's the water doing and where is the fish likely to be. So in those really big water years, the season started late. Who knows where the fish spawned? They might have been in a farmer's field somewhere. There was just so much water everywhere. We had fish up behind our garage. OK, so it was really interesting to see. But uh the, the volume of water uh, really did a number on the weeds the weeds were slow to get started in those years so it was more about current and uh structure and the slack water around certain aspects of structure that was um successful for us in those flood years 
2017 and 19, when I looked through my logs, 2019 um, was uh, my worst June ever. And that was the second time through on the flood. And interestingly, you had that five fish trip with the Vizendis. Um, you know, amazing. And looking at those pictures, that water is brown, dirty. It is not fly friendly. You know, it wasn't big lure friendly. So, you know, getting right on those fish as you did um, and, and having the success, you know, the, the best trip of that month was on flies. Really different June, different years for us. 2018, 2020, um, Mike Kadura and Mike Spratt, any, do you guys get to look at your logs from those years? Um, how did they, how did they do at the start for you? And uh, how similar are they to 2021? Go yeah. ahead, Mike. Um, 2020, last year, um, I do remember it was a slow start. That that two weeks after opener, um, they were that was a very tough time for me. Um, and of course, you can it, you can always do things right, and if the fish don't cooperate, they're not going to cooperate. Um, that was my biggest uh, memory from that, uh, from probably both those years, um, was opener. Uh, the, you know, the first few days were okay, opening day probably a fish or two, but then maybe um, maybe a few skunks in a row um, until we really got to the heat of summer and the water warms up, and then the and then the July bite is uh, is usually the best for me, best part of the year, um, especially for numbers of fish. Okay, Mike Kadura. Well, on, on yours, when it was flooding, when there was flooding, it was try to find some cleaner water and try to find some weeds or where I know and imagine weeds are going to be growing. Even if I can't quite see them, my experience in knowing where the water is and being, you know, like we've all been on the water for years up here now, that I know that there are going to be weeds growing there, you know, and I saw them last year. And so finding it in the flood years like that. Last year and the years in between the floods, uh, yeah, I, you know, the, the very, I think it was the first trip getting out the very beginning, you know, you're kind of seeing fish and they're not as interested. You kind of get, they're not, but, but within two weeks, you know, and last year, first day, you know, first trip, um, uh, when guiding started, which was, I think a week into the season for me, um, I had a mother and fa uh, a father and a daughter, a daughter brought him out for her birth, brought dad out for his birthday. And, uh, we got one really nice fish. I think about a 46 incher, um, at the end of the day in a place where we had a little bit of clearer water and some weeds and there was an eddy there. And it was a spot where I knew it, wa where I knew it be gone. So the years in between floods have been pretty good early on for me. And, uh, and last year was great. It just seemed great. And I, I'm assuming it's going to even be a little bit better earlier this year because of the the low water and the, a lot of light penetrating. Um, but flood years are, that's tough. Even driving around, like Peter was saying, you know, debris and stuff. Like we didn't, weren't able to get on the water the years of the flood early. So you didn't know what was out there. And then you get out there and there's logs and things and places that you didn't see. And there's still sometimes things washing down underneath the surface. So you gotta be careful when it's that time, when it's, when it's, when it's like that. Yep, should be should be safe. Shouldn't be debris this year. Um, to me, this year resembles two thousand closer to two thousand eighteen and two thousand twenty, obviously than the flood years. Two thousand eighteen, we had um, we had the fish um, spawn before the opener. And Lisa, I have a uh, I think I have a picture of Mario and Pat with a fish that we got in the first hour of the 2018 season. I, I'm 51 and change, I I think. And that's the boy's first first muskie. So that was, uh, um, you know, first hour, a lot of years, the big fish aren't ready to go. This year, the big girls are going to be ready to go. That was close to a spawning area in the deep water, um, um, just, you know, off of the weed structures. Again, out in a little bit deeper so that's what i expect to happen this year 2020 for me lisa and i missed a fish on opening day out there we fished with you mike out on the rito that day mm -hmm. and, and the only fish that we found on the opening day on the rito 
um, ate Lisa's lure while we were standing having a conversation. And she missed it. So I just I tell her she wasn't paying attention, got to pay attention all the time. But I actually went I went 38 calendar days in a row with fish last year, which I think is a record um, early in the year. So um, similar year this year. Um, yeah. Is that you, Mike? Yeah, that's the that's the one that was the, the first trip last year. Right at sun, right at sundown. That's when the fish went off. And that was the father and daughter. And that, that was a really nice fish, the opening weekend of the trip. And I, I knew it was going to be a good season then. Fish yeah. it, right? Came on, it came in on a figure eight, turned at the boat. We were just getting, you know, looking okay. It's getting to be sundown time. We should be getting something now. And uh, I think the smile says it all. Yeah, absolutely. And if you saw the tail and the fins on that fish, beat up. A lot of yeah. competition, a lot of fighting with the boys uh, going through that spring. What are you going to do different this year? What what did you do different to prepare? What are you going to do different this year out on the water, guys? Well, I, I think in terms of different, I, I agree with you, John, that I think this is going to be more like 2018, 2000, maybe 2020, but certainly 18. Um, I, I had a really good start. Uh, Musky factory baits were working really well. Uh, we were running mag eights rather than tens uh, early in the season. And that's something that I, I, I like to do. And maybe that's because the fish respond really well, but you can crank those mag eights really quickly. But they're also a little easier on a fisherman who hasn't been fishing all season as well. So, you know, there's the human factor in there as well, you know, yeah. especially for us old guys. So, yeah. you know, that's really good. But it, can I just have Lisa throw up a couple of uh, pictures that I said, and John, you haven't seen these, but these were for uh, my first couple of musky factory gigs in 2018. Uh, this was trolling. Uh, this was a 49 and a half, uh, first muskie for, for uh, this guy. And Lisa, if you can show the bait that it was on, uh, you know, there it is. Uh, so we were trolling that in four feet of water and, you know, had a big one come up. The next one was about three days later. Uh, and that fish, if you move on to the next one, uh, the next photo of it, you know, like that was a big girl. So she was still in shallow at that point. Uh, and this was the 25th, uh, 26th of June. Uh, so, you know, right after the season starts. So this year, I'm going to be looking at that, you know, kind of not too deep water that's right on the edge of the deeper water and working that transition. Muskies love edges. You know, they're, they're, they, they want to be able to be uh, where they can move off if that's where the food happens to be or where they can move in if that's where the food happens to be and again um working blades is a really really good thing i think at the beginning of the season uh we know that our fish get conditioned like by the end of the summer if you're using the same bait that you start the season with you'll probably see less activity you have to reinvent or be creative or change something up in a way but over winter they haven't seen any baits. So first stuff that they see in the spring, you've got a, a, a tactical advantage. But there are things that you can do uh, where you can actually, um, you know, uh, move baits relatively quickly, move good size baits, uh, and uh, and go for those fish that you're you're really looking at uh, that are um, they're hungry. They've done their spawn. They've recuperated. It's not quite summer yet, but they're eating. I mean, that's that they want to be able to put on body mass as the water warms up uh, to get ready for the summer. So, you know, I, I think those transition areas uh, where there's there's new and emergent weeds, uh, get some baits moving. Don't be afraid to fish quickly, but not as quickly as you would in the peak of the summer. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the water temperatures are going to be up already you know, into the mid to high 60s already in the main channel and, you know, another 10 degrees higher than that in the, uh, in the bays. Uh, don't be shy to fish fast. They should have a full load of energy right off the bat this year. So, yeah, don't have to slow down. Not at all. Mike Spratt, what are you going to do different this year? This year, I, I was just trying to think about that. Um, 
um, because I haven't, uh, I can't say I've reflected on it a lot, um, but uh, there's two things that I'm looking for this year, uh, looking forward to this year. Um, The first one is, um, as somebody mentioned, is using the surface surface baits earlier in the year and start those because in July, those are, they are fantastic, right? There's nothing better than fishing, you know, especially sundown uh, in July. And if we're going to be, you know, uh, half a season ahead of ourselves, then uh, we're gonna we're gonna be able to uh, go uh, start up well with uh, surface baits, which is always a highlight. Um, the other uh, the other one that I'm really looking forward to this year that I've never I've never had in my own arsenal um, is uh, working with staggered blades. Peter was talking about the the blades, and we've always made stag- staggered blades. People have asked for them sort of as customs and I've always put them together and looked at them and said, maybe. Um, but this year, um, you know, we made them a thing. We coupled them with the with the Sonic Bell, um, which is really gonna make a racket. It's gonna be different in the water. So I'm really looking forward to, um, to uh, throwing a few of those um, and working them and in the spring. Lisa shared a photo when uh, when I was talking earlier about uh, three fish um, on opener weekend. That was uh, Lake Cashabog, um, and that's me doing uh, the most courteous release you can ever do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. and that's a tricky photo to take because that's that's pre GoPro, right? That's uh, uh, we used to buy those disposable underwater cameras. You, we would get those. And snap as many underwater shots as we could, and that's uh, that's one of my favorite release shots of all time. And that's an opening day, which also means really? that's really cold water. Uh, thanks, Lisa, for sharing that. <laughs> Mike Spratt, an outside the box musky angler and musky release angler, for sure. You know the staggered blades. Uh, you hit on something big there. Um, last year we crushed it on staggered blades. Um, Lorraine, we, I think I got six giant fish in the first month of the season on staggered blades. Lorinda Goodwin got that really spectacular one, figure eighting at the side of the boat. I had guests with two in one night, two just a hair under 50 in one night. Um, and so we like that so much that we just put staggered blades from now on um, um, on our Sonics. And so you want something different something the fish definitely haven't seen, staggered ba- blades and a bell on a Sonics with unique colors. That's something for sure. So, yeah, I'm going to take way more advantage of that this year. What are you rubbing your hands together for, Mikey? What do you want to do? <laughs> well, well, the thing about the the staggered, like Mike started to say that, and I was going to be like, all right, I'm going to let you in on a secret. Staggered blades with the Sonics this year, right? But then you both guys have kind of already said it. So <laughs> I'd say I'd say staggered blade Sonics, but matching colors, custom colors, got a lot of new that sort of thing. And then I normally keep this until the end. I normally don't use this early in the year, but this year they came out with this, and I'm gonna sh- share the screen with you. Um, they came out with this, the, the, the Weagle, but they also have the, the Woogle and it's a little bit of a subsurface bait. And I'm thinking I'm going to be using these baits, uh, a, a lot earlier this year because, you know, they get the illusion of a bait moving slowly when it, um, and it isn't, you know, because it doesn't move very far and you got, you work on that walk, walk the dog, you know, which is a skill you work on that doing that well and if the water's low and you want to get up there shallow around weeds and work it in a little pocket that's going to be one of the real baits i'm really looking forward to using a lot more whereas normally i would i hold off and use it a little bit later in the year when the fish like peter had said they've already seen some baits you know but i know we're going to be hitting them on inlines right away and then i'm going to be using that that and the the, the those top waters that kind of look like they're moving fast rather than just the prop baits prop baits are great but i'm gonna that's what i'm looking forward to Should you and i are gonna off. you and i are gonna compare notes uh at the end of the season <laughs> or part way through the season Getting excited you, you're a walk the dog guy with the suic weagle and i am a a hundred percent a big mama guy going straight with the tail so we're gonna go head to head and compare some numbers on a on a musky monday uh weekly update later on in the year um guys we're 
like almost on time for our uh, for our segment, which we which we rarely do. So now that we're 20 episodes in, maybe we're finally getting better at scheduling. Um, I asked you guys uh, earlier, um, maybe with not enough notice, but was there a favorite moment, a learning moment, or something that you took out of the uh, the Muskie Monday seminar series? We had so, we had. We had the who's who of anybody I could have dreamed of to come on here. All the greatest of the greatest, um, the most experienced people, authors, guides, biologists that came on here and gave us um, really great information, candid conversations. There was so much gold there. Is there a moment uh, or a tip that stuck out for you? Mike Kadura, I know you, uh, you answered that question really quickly. Yeah, I have, I mean, you know, I started doing push-ups because of Spence Berman, but really the Jim Sarek, when he was talking about the islands, it's one hour and 21 minutes and 55 seconds into the video. And if you watch him talk about the islands, he talks about rocky side of the island being on the north and the western shore, and that the weedy side and the mucky side, the sandier bottoms are on the south and the southwest shore. You know, when you think about an island and that structure, as soon as he said that, I was like, dang, that's true. And 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 that tells you, do you want to use a suic on that rocks? Do you want to use, you know, something that, that's more like a minnow bait that you can bang into the rocks when you get onto the other side of the island? And that is so true on not just lakes, like he was talking about Lake of the Woods, but on rivers also. And it really tells you, you know, depending on the day and the temperature and a lot of factors, you might want to hit those rocks. And, 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 and you know what side of the island they're going to be on based on what he said. You know, you basically, you know that. And uh, and I thought that was a real, you know, Sarek's a hero to me, like so many of you guys are. But but being able to pick that up and kind of know what, realize you something that you know that you didn't know you knew. <laughs> Does that make sense? You know, yeah. like I knew that, but I didn't know I knew that. And now I like, okay, I'm going to keep that one in mind. So that was that was that was very cool for me. That was one of the probably three or four big highlights, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, and and that that specific um, segment that you're talking about speaks to patterning muskies. You know, he's talking about wind direction consistently from the you know southwest or northwest on islands, and so you get a repeated pattern from island to island of where the wind blows, where the silt ends up, where the leeward side is and over the years you know the islands become very similar and so you can pattern you realize the muskies are on the windward side at the front you know then you can go take that from island to island and hedrick taught me something on the ottawa river years ago and it wasn't until he said it the same way sarek did he talked about creeks and river mouths and every creek and every river mouth carries sediment and the sediment deposits out in front of that creek or river mouth. Doesn't matter how big they are. And then there gets to be a bigger line of sediment and deposit, which is rich and grows weeds. And you have a an open water segment in front of it. And so it just, him explaining how that exists at every creek just opened up a different way to, to pattern things and a different way to understand that the fish options at every single creek and river mouth on there so yep absolutely um peter levick anything that uh, that you and maria thanks maria if you're there in the background for uh, <laughs> for enduring and watching all the musky monday seminar series all along and i can't wait to see you and mode with l'eco de l'acadie at some point this summer so um i know she's in the background there was there anything that you liked in particular this year, Peter? John, I think my favorite episode was Spencer Berman. I really liked that. I got writer's cramp taking down notes by the end of it, you know, but it's it, he's such a legend and he's such a good presenter. He's got incredible amount of information that he, he's able to just kind of bring forward. I really enjoyed that. But I also wanted to take a step back a little bit and recognize the, the 20 shows that uh, you guys have put together. It's been absolutely awesome. We've all been starved for musky content. And, you know, you and Lisa have done a terrific job. 
and Mike with your input and Mike and with Sean. I just want to congratulate you on the whole series. I think the Muscular world has really enjoyed it. And thank you for your work to put all of that together for us so that we could learn, so that we could enjoy it. And it's been, uh, it's been really a great effort and congratulations. Thanks, it's been fun, a big learning experience and uh, a whole lot of musky love coming back our way from the musky community all along. So just uh, rewarding on, on so many levels. Thanks for saying that, Peter. Um, we'll get Mike Spratt to comment on his favorite moment and then we'll bring the woman of the hour, the chicken who sits behind the scenes there. We're going to bring her out to give us a final word or two. Um, yes, good. Thank you. The uh, My favorite moment, um, I have to say my favorite moment uh, was uh, watching Hedrick uh, back in the limelight uh, because he, he really was the guy um, that taught me how to catch muskies. Um, you know, we, uh, we started Muskies Canada. I had not caught a muskie when I joined Muskies Canada. I didn't know how to catch a muskie, but I knew how to try and had seen them. And, um, and uh, he, was, he was just such a pivotal person. And uh, y you could tell that, uh, you know, he always gave great information and he was happy to give up spots. He was happy to fish with people. And so seeing him back in the spotlight uh, for me was a highlight. Um, and then of course, as a bait guy, um, every person who came on here and gave some little trick or tip as to how they modify their bait, I eat that up like there's no tomorrow. You know, Gordon Liam gave away some great stuff. Yes. Um, Spencer Berman, he gave away some great stuff about how to play with your plastics. And so that's, that's the kind of thing that just, you know, makes me really excited. Absolutely. Um, so many great moments. You hit on uh, just a couple more there. And uh, Lisa, you got out of doing this with us, but we're going to bring you out for the last moment. Um, I think you're going to be looking for a new producer next year. <laughs> just had to get through the 20 episodes. You did it. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, I mean, it was tough when you asked me that question, you know, I, I, I can genuinely say I took something away from every single episode. I particularly enjoyed uh, Sean Landsman's, Dr. Landsman's segments. I mean, that was just absolutely incredible information you can't access every day. Uh, so, and, and going back to what Peter said, um, my favorite Sean Landsman topic was the Spencer Berman episode. So that was really cool, you know, talking about how muskies see color and yeah, even like the details of the actual eye structure and how it makes sense with the rods and cones. And, you know, sometimes I really, and, and this kind of just cemented it for me, how much sometimes the lures are, are more to catch the angler than the fish. You know, we, we overcomplicate things. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I genuinely learned so much from that. I learned a ton from Spencer, including, um, you know, another tactic I want to try this year because generally 80% of the time I'm fishing shallow and I think there's a huge, uh, you know, opportunity on the Ottawa even for some open water muskies and now that I'm going to have my uh, fourth generation hummingbird sign imaging, I will be able to do some scouting out there for sure. Absolutely. I think you hit on you hit on something big for this year with, uh, with the really low water that we're going to have later on. The weed lines are going to be very distinct. Those fish are just going to get beat up. So um, exploring off the weed lines and into the deeper water, definitely um, definitely a big idea. Um, man, this thing grew into way more than I envisioned when it probably started over, uh, over sipping a little too much scotch one night back at the, the end of December. And so it's... Uh, uh, um, um, really pleased with uh, i'm really proud of the people that i have here as as my team around me getting to hang out and work with you guys and baits and guiding is just a uh, reward in itself day after day this was a huge undertaking um for all of us and especially for lisa week after week after week behind the scenes um there's a lot more work goes into this show than you realize so um to all the guests uh, my dream lists of guests came out and and said yes all of them said yes for this show and um the knowledge uh the 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 knowledge accumulation um just 
wow, this is a library that'll be there for a long time. And I'm going to go back and continue to learn from it. Uh, I contacted my friend Robert Mason in Glasgow, Scotland, because Robert's been here live for almost every broadcast watching at one and two o'clock in the morning in Glasgow. He's somebody that I got to meet through my muskie guiding world over here. Um, he's an amazing pike fisherman, a really well-known and successful pike fisherman in Scotland. More than that, he's an incredible guy. And I was hoping at the end of the show to, to take my, uh, my hearts of Midlothian glass here, which would offend him greatly being a Glasgow Rangers fan. But, and I wanted to take some Magna Breche. This is a, a Canadian whiskey, a, an unbelievable Canadian whiskey. If you're a Scott guy, Scotch guy, is Una there with a Scotch, Mike? We talked about this. She's going to get one right now. She's going to get one right now. We <laughs> talked about this while we were sitting, while we were all making hybrids together on the weekend. But you know, Robert's been there. I think he's he's watched from the farthest away of anyone. Um, it's unbelievable. We had so many people from California, Texas, Florida, all kinds of Europeans watching this. In addition to all the amazing guests and a ton of people from Wisconsin out there. So. Robert Mason, I'm I'm sorry that you couldn't join us this evening, but um, I want to raise this glass of fine Canadian whiskey, not Scotch, Canadian whiskey, um, to you and to all the people and to the team here and to all the people that um, have gone on this journey together. Hurry up, Una! <laughs> <laughs> Don't fall down the stairs. stairs yet, so we can hold them up. I got, no, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for Una. Una was <laughs> Una was spinning lures. Una was spinning hybrids with us in the backyard and telling stories uh, this past great. weekend. We made we made a couple hundred hybrids the team fun. together. So we're ready One for the season. Hurry up, Una! <laughs> <laughs> there, I can hear her upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Probably getting just the right mix of ice. <laughs> oh. You don't put ice in scotch. <laughs> okay, okay. Some people put ice in scotch. A little bit of water just to open up the taste. But so, oh. Anybody got a good musky joke? <laughs> we have a question from Luke, uh, John. Any plans to go again next year? To do this again next year. Um, <laughs> Lisa already said that she's going to recover, require at least twice as much money in her contract <laughs> as she got this year. So um, we're going to work on it, Luke. We're going to work on it. Um, maybe a different format. You know, this was a lot of fun. Um, Lisa did a really great presentation for the Ottawa chapter of Muskies Canada last week with a bunch of pre-recorded segments. And because we're going to capture so much awesome video this year, Doug Wagner's video in talking with him, um, Doug films all year and then processes video in the off season. So we're going to have a ton of video. We're going to work young James into the ground. We're going to teach him to be an awesome video producer as well. We're going to produce great stuff. And I saw her in the background. What you doing now, Mike? She's here. She's here. Yeah. She's ready. Yeah, she she is. Is. <laughs> Part of the team has... a whiskey mac. What, what do you got? I've got a whiskey mac. A whiskey mac. <laughs> So right. a, little, a little bit of whiskey and some Krabby's green ginger wine. So here's okay. to John. Okay. Well, to the whole Muskie Factory team, to everybody who tuned in and enjoyed us along the way on this journey, to all the Americans who came out, to all the Europeans, and to Robert Mason in Glasgow. Thank you guys for the joining us on the Cheers. Monday Cheers, everybody. Cheers to Glasgow. What a, what a journey. All the best, everybody. We'll Have a great season. Year.